Well, welcome to this short video, which is going to look at how to render a glass of orange juice in Houdini. And this is going to make use of the uniform volume uh, method that was new in Houdini 12. But first of all, let's have a quick look at the scene. Uh, what I've got here already modelled is a glass, and the glass is divided into a number of different bits. and that is according to whether or not the glass is next to water, next to air, or rather next to the orange juice or next to the air. So uh, this part here is going to be the glass next to the air. And as you can see, it, it finishes sort of halfway down the glass there. Uh, then there's a bit which is going to be the glass next to the liquid. So this is the bottom part of the inside of the glass, and that's going to be next to the liquid. Then we've got uh, the top of the liquid, which is going to obviously have the air on one side of it and the liquid on the other. And it's important to model uh, a liquid or a glass containing a liquid in that way, because that's the only way you can get the shaders to use the correct indices of refraction. And that's important for getting a realistic look. The other thing we've got here is a solid uh, representing uh, the whole of the liquid. So this includes both where the liquid is next to the glass and where it's next to the air. And we're going to use that in a moment. The other thing that's very important here is that you take a look at where your normals are pointing. Now the normals are, thing, are the things which show you uh, where the render is going to consider the outside of the object to be and where it's going to consider the inside of the object. So if we, example, if we for example, look at the glass interacting with the air and we turn on the view of the normals we can see that those point out from the glass in other words they point out towards the air and when we look at the glass liquid uh, we can see that they point in towards the liquid and away from the glass and you've got to have a consistent set of normals in order to be able to use the shaders but before we get on to applying shaders, I just wanted, sort of by way of diversion, to take a look at this straw that I've got here. So we can see it's a straw. It, what I would like is for this straw to be bent at the top here. And I just wanted to take a minute to show you uh, an easy way to do that. And that's using a wire deformer. So the first thing we need to do is pop down a line and we need to make it uh, quite large, so let's increase it up like that. That should do. And we need plenty of points, so let's give it 20 points. Now, a wire deformer is a way of deforming a complicated object using the changes between two states of a line or a wire. So uh, the first thing you need to do in order to use a line deformer, or a wire deformer rather, is to lay down a wire capture node and this has two inputs one of which is the geometry that you're eventually going to deform which is going to be our straw and the other is the wire and if we now visualize this we can see uh, that it has these circles here and that they're colored blue and that means that uh, this wire has captured all of that geometry. In other words, it's linked every point in this complex geometry into a single point on that line, which had 20 points. Uh, so we can, uh, we can change the dimensions and so on of the wire capture radius here, like so. I'm not going to go into all of that. You can experiment with it. So the next thing we need to do, uh, and what I'll do to make this easier is just lay down a null here. The next thing we need to do is deform our wire. So let's just take that, take the wire, and I'm going to turn off the display. Actually, no, I, I probably want that on. Turn on display of the straw. And I hit S and 2, select points. And I'm just going to select down to where the, the kinks are in the in the straw there. Uh, and then I'm going to hit R to rotate. And that'll allow us to rotate that. And then if I hit T, I'm then going to be able to transform it 
and that's going to let me put this this bend into the wire. And then finally, in order to apply that deformation to the straw, uh, we could lay down a wire deform. And the wire deform has three inputs. The first is going to be the geometry that we want to deform. The second is going to be the wire, or in this case the line, in its undeformed state. And then finally, the wire in its deformed state, like so. And what we should see now is that our straw has a kink in it. That's a very simple example. In fact, uh, in this case, it would probably be just as easy to transform the geometry directly. But I thought it was worth demonstrating how the wire deformer works, and that can be useful in modeling quite often. Well, all I've done now is transform the straw so that it uh, is resting against the side of, side of the glass there, like so. And I've already got a camera set up here, so that's going to give us a view of our glass. Let's now set up some shaders. Uh, um, I've already got something, just a, a basic clay shader applied to the floor there. Uh, what I need is some glass shaders, so let me lay down a glass shader. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to go into the shop context. So this is going to be the glass to air shader. So that's going to be where the glass is touching the air. Let me control C, control V that to get a copy. And this is going to be the glass to liquid. And then control C, control V. This is going to be liquid to air. OK. That's all working well so far. So in the case of the glass to air, I need to go onto my refract tab. And in fact, this is pretty much what we want, which is that the inside of the glass has an index refraction of 1.5, which is, which is more or less the refraction of glass. And the outside has an index refraction of 1, which is air. When we get to the glass to the liquid, uh, the inside is still going to be uh, the, the 1.5, but we're probably going to need something like 1.3 for the inside. And then the liquid to air, uh, you'll have guessed, is going to be 1.3 on the inside and 1 on the outside. So let's just uh, apply these. So glass to air is going to need the glass to air material, the glass to liquid is going to need the glass to liquid material and the liquid to air is of course going to need liquid to air. I'm going to turn off the display of the, the liquid hole here and uh, we'll, we'll add that in later on. I've already got a couple of lights set up in this scene. When you're rendering glass it's always a good idea to have an environment light so let me add one of those. I'm going to add an environment light. And let's just, for the sake of this example, use the skies texture, which comes with Houdini, like so. And I've got an area light. Uh, we can probably zoom out and see the area light. There's the area light, uh, which is going to reflect nicely off the glass. So we're all set up now to do our first render. So let's uh, set this up to look through the camera and give it a go. And there we are. We can see that it's looking it's looking pretty good. Uh, we're getting a nice uh, kink in the straw here, which is what we would expect due to the differing indexes indices of refraction, and we're getting the good uh, reflection of the of the area light there. But you can see at the bottom here that this is still very polygonal. So in fact, what I want to do is render all of these objects as uh, subdivision surfaces. So let's turn that off and go back up to the top here. And all of these objects, in fact, all of these, I'm going to want to go onto the Render tab. And this, in fact, has moved this, this checkbox from Houdini 12 to Houdini 13. But Render as Subdivision Surface we need to tick this, and that should ensure that these now render as a perfectly rounded, smooth subdivision surface, like so. 
Well, that's looking pretty good. Uh, let's now try and add some orange to the glass. And you might think that you would you would uh, add orange, for example, by playing about with the diffuse component of your your liquid to air shader, or perhaps adding some subsurface scattering or something like that. And you can more or less do it that way, but it's very uh, complicated, doesn't give very good results. The better way to do it when you're rendering using the PBR renderer is to use a uniform volume, and that's what we're going to do here. So first of all, let's set up our uniform volume. Uh, so we need to go and find our object. And the thing that we're going to put as a uniform volume is this liquid hole node here. And in order to make it a uniform volume, we're going to need to edit the parameters. So we go to Edit Rendering Parameters. And we need to look, in fact, it's already there. We need to look for uniform. And then we can see on the sampling tab, uniform volume. And we need to add that, make sure that's added to our node, like so. And I'm going to accept that. Let me turn off the rendering. So what's this? Uh, ah, and in fact, I, I've done it on the wrong uh, on the wrong one, that, do, that doesn't matter, let's just make sure it's turned off. So that's fine, it's turned off. So in fact I want it on this one, uh, and it looks like I, I added that earlier, so on this liquid hole geometry we want a uniform volume parameter added, and we want to enable it. Now what does this do? This means that from the, for the purposes of shading, this is considered not as a polygonal object, uh, with reflections off its surface and so on, it's considered as a shape which is filled with a volume, in other words, a cloud with uniform density. And the advantage of this method over, say, for example, creating a volume is that you have very precise boundaries to that volume. They, they exactly fit the polygonal geometry that you define for the outside of the volume. And secondly, it's much faster to render than a more complicated volume because the renderer knows that it has a uniform density throughout and that means it can calculate very quickly uh, the shading. But you've got to be very careful with the shaders you apply to something which has this uniform volume property. So let me just create a shader. Let's, let's say we wanted to use the um, for example constant smoke shader. Let's, let's put one of those down. Uh, let's make this a sort of orangey color and then perhaps uh, we could assign this to our constant uniform volume rather so there we go and then let's enable it and let's render and you can see it's not really producing anything at all To get this to work, uh, we're going to have to use a very specific shader that comes with Houdini. So let me just uh, delete that shader, in fact. And we need the uniform volume shader, which is down here. So let me add one of those. And uh, let's go to my shop context, uniform volume. And let's call this orange juice. And let's make it... Uh, an orange color, maybe a bit lighter than that. Uh, that should be fine. And let's have a look at that now. Let's uh, make sure the liquid here is using that shoulder, like so. And then let's render. And we can see now, immediately, we're getting something which looks a little bit more like orange juice. Uh, let me just stop that render. Now one of the things you can do in the interactive render view is to subselect an area to render uh, rather than rendering the whole view every time. And we do this by clicking, uh, hitting the shift key and holding it and then dragging out an area like so. And what that will do now is just render that area. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to use that to set the density of this, uh, of this uh, orange juice properly. So let me uh, use 
there's this here and I think this probably needs a density of maybe 2.5 or something like that uh, and you can see when we increase the density the orange juice starts to starts to darken and we can cheat on this because that, that probably doesn't look too realistic for orange juice and um, we can cheat by turning down the uh, shadow multiplier here which means that it will use a less dense volume when calculating shadows which means your your volume will, will look brighter and this isn't realistic uh, but quite often you can't tell the difference so let's do that and we can see immediately that that has has lightened up so let's have a look now at some other rendering settings that affect the render of the orange juice so go to the output context and I'm going to lay down a fresh mantra node and when you're dealing with uh, uniform volumes you want to use the PBR rendering engine so uh, let's change this to physically based rendering and then further down here we can set some rather here we can set some sampling parameters and we probably it's, it's quite a noisy image we probably need to increase the number of samples to 25 maximum samples reduce the noise level down to 0 0.02 those are two controls that will improve the quality of the image while unfortunately meaning that it takes longer to render the volume quality and the volume shadow quality and the transparent sampling parameters aren't actually going to affect uh, the uniform volume. These only apply to non-uniform volumes, in other words, complex volumes such as uh, pyro simulations and so on. So those are the main things that we, that we need to do. Uh, so let me just uh, render this out and have a look and see what it looks like. But I'm going to pause the video while I do that. Well, now we've rent out the whole of that, we can see uh, that we in fact have some problems here. That the, the top of this orange juice is very unrealistic. It's, it's very dark. Uh, and the reason for that is, in fact, uh, lies in our glass shader. So let me find the glass shader. Um, where are we? Shop context. And let me select all of those glass shaders here. And if we have a look at the opacity tab here, we can see that we've got uh, something called enable false caustics. And the glass shader that ships with Udini 13 is not uh, really a uh, physically correct shader. Uh, it approximates the shadows cast by the glass. And we can see that uh, it's got this these two parameters, max shadow, min shadow intensity, which of course should be zero, and max shadow intensity, which is one. Now we probably don't want that to be 1. If we make it say 0.3, uh, what we should find is, and let me shade the top of this, so shift and drag, and what we should now see is that we'll get a much more, a much brighter top to that, to that liquid. Another thing we can do to change the appearance of the top here is to ensure that on our materials the interface between the liquid and the air doesn't have too great a specular intensity and I've already turned this down. Uh, if you have a very high specular intensity then you're really just going to get a reflection of the sky potentially on the top here. The other thing you'll have noticed I've done is, is move the position of the camera so we can actually see directly the top of this. It still have, a, as you can see, looks quite sort of dark, this, this orange juice. Uh, that's partly because uh, I've also changed the, the color to be a bit more orange. Uh, it was a bit pale. Uh, but also it's because you're not getting any bouncing of light within this volume. You're not getting the equivalent, if you like, to subsurface scattering. Uh, and it's that which is a natural property of things like milk and orange juice, which makes them appear so bright. Now, unfortunately, when we're using the PPR renderer, we can, in effect, replicate that using this 
tab here, the, the shading tab, and what we can do is increase the volume limit. And the volume limit allows us to bounce light around within this volume. So let me do that, and let me re-render uh, a, a part of this and see what we get. And we can see straight away that that's a lot brighter than it was before. And a couple of other changes before we do our final render. Uh, one of which is to change the color limit, which is default to 10, down to 3. The color limit is the thing that stops you getting these very bright spots. And because we're using an environment light with a, with a texture applied to it, those can be a problem. So that will, that will help address that. And I think we probably also want to increase the render samples. Sorry, let's go to the sampling tab to 50, maybe 25. So that should give us a pretty good image. So let me render this. Uh, I'm going to pause the video while this renders out. And uh, then we'll come back. So there we have it, our final glass of orange juice. And you can see that uh, the use of the volume does have some, some pretty good side effects. First of all, you can see that this very accurate way that the straw disappears into the liquid and we can see it uh, we can see it descend there. You get to see a little bit of the straw through the liquid here and right at the edges of the liquid you get this sort of rim effect uh, which is very characteristic. And if you were trying to use subsurface surface scattering for example you, you really wouldn't get anything as good as that. So that's a reasonably accurate uh, render of a glass of orange juice. I hope that's been helpful.